Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Yeah, it should be good, Mom. I'm just about to drive to the airport now. <laughs> yeah, just be sure to save some beats for me. <laughs> yeah, I love you too. See you and Dad in a few hours. Bye. Hey! hey dummy! Yellow alert! I hate when you guys do that. Okay, um... So I'm all packed and ready for my vacation to Florida. You sure you guys going to be all right without me for a week? Um, Josh, you want to tell him? Uh, I thought that we agreed that you were going to be the one to tell him. Oh, no. Tom, we're going with you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we already packed our bags. Bags? Where? No, oh, we just used your luggage. That's why your stuff's in the pile over there. <sighs> I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this down. Oh, hey, let's get going on the vacation. Yay. Yeah, let's go. Come Woo-hoo. on. Yes. Woo-hoo. Yes. Uh, wait, who's driving? You know, I'll go ahead and drive first. You know, it's my car, but, you know, sure. We're all, all right, shotgun. Okay, sounds good to me. We'll just trade off each stop. Yep, see, I'll be driving this time. Tom, shotgun. Dan, you're in the back seat, so it'll go Josh, Tom, then Dan. And we'll just switch it up each time we stop. Work like a charm. Yeah, I can't believe I'm agreeing to this. Yay. <laughs> All right, come on, come on, move, 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 we have to move. It was a 15-minute drive. Why did we have to change over that many times? Why did it take an hour? I have a small bladder. Yeah, you've also been drinking a big gulp the size of my torso. I told you to stop that. But they were a dollar twenty-nine. I mean. Give me that. Seriously, plain. Okay, whatever, but I get the window seat. Oh, guys, no, please, guys, no, not again. No, 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 Tom gets the window seat. That, that would be like the driver's seat Tom hasn't sat there yet. Oh, my God, Tom drove the second time we changed over. It's my turn now. I get the window seat. I just wanted a normal vacation. Guys, stop. There's no need to argue. No, Tom gets the window seat. Yeah, it's Tom's turn to drive. There's no driving. It's an airplane. No, Tom drove before you. It's my turn to drive. Again, airplane, assigned seats. Whatever, take the goddamn seat. But, you know, it's going to be Tom, Josh, then Dan next time. Whatever, fine. Thank you. Move. Okay, so apparently the next leg of our journey is a hang glider. Very topical. I know, right? I know it's been four days, Mom, but we just ran into some changes to the itinerary, but we should be there soon. Uh, Me and Dan and Josh. Josh. Oh, hello. Mom? Anywho, so who's sitting on the left? God, not this again. It's Dan, Josh, then Tom this time. It's been explained. No, it was supposed to be Dan, Tom, then Josh. But you screwed it up on the drive from St. Louis. Guys, we are already strapped in. Why are you still arguing this? No, no, it's Dan, Josh, then Tom. It's the order we go in because it's the one that makes the most sense. It made sense before you screwed it up on the drive. Here, look, I wrote it out on the sheet of paper and this one makes the most logical Uh, flow. Read it. uh, I am not using some scrap of paper you just made up. This is what I think of your scrap. Moving closer to the edge. Asshole, you know what? You're not using it because Uh, it makes sense. Guys! Not sure if you noticed, but we're now about a thousand feet in the air! Yeah, let's watch it. No, no, no! It's my turn to say it this week. Tom said it last week, you the week before. It's on the schedule! Why well, change the order? Why? Because we can't do this joke again. We did it last week. No, it's stupid because you keep changing the order. We keep doing it because you changed the order. You're stupid. <laughs> Yeah, let's watch it. We're on a hang glider! Strikes back. 
The Fire Pit strikes back with its second season as Dan, Tom, and Josh jump into hyperspace to the Empire Strikes Back. We're altering the podcast. Pray we don't alter it further. And listeners, and welcome to another enduring episode of The Fire Pit. I'm Tom, Sith name Darth Stupidious, and we're finally back from Mongo and reaching the penultimate stop on our way to the 1980s, The Empire Strikes Back. Now, before we just see how many rocks Luke Skywalker can lift with his mind... We need to glide on down to tonight's film. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. And now, to tell us about who we're watching and what we're watching, I shall send things over to Josh. We're in a different order because Josh changed it and Dan ignored it. And that's all Dan's (laughs) fault. But thank you, Tom. So Josh here, bounty hunter name Kletso Tripped, and I'm going on connections tonight because I had to change the script because Dan screwed it up. But last week, we saw Robbie Coltrane, the only actor who had the good sense to get the hell out of Flash Gordon, you know, before the rest of us could have, you know, it may have been the best thing for him in his career anywho. Yeah, but we should have followed his example. We should have. We really should have. But hopefully tonight, uh, we'll get to see more of him in tonight's feature film. 1989's Slipstream, starring Mark Hamill, Bill Paxton, and F. Murray Abraham. First time since Midnight Special, the three of us are going into a movie completely blind. None of us had seen last week's movie, but we had an idea of what to expect. We have no idea what to expect tonight. So hopefully, hopefully we can uh, shed some light on what we're going to watch tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, slip things over to Dan. Thank you, Josh. I'm Dan. A Jedi name can't do it. And... Tonight, as mentioned, we are watching the 1989 smash slipstream. No, seriously, this was a smash bomb. This movie tanked like the ratings for heroes. And it tanked so bad, I couldn't even find any budget or box office information on this. Uh, hopefully, Josh here in a little bit can shed more light on that, but I couldn't find crap. All I could find was it had a release date of February 10th, 1989 in the United Kingdom and Australia only. This didn't even get a release in the United States. Has a running time of 102 minutes, so mercifully it just clocks in at just above 90 minutes. And it has a Rotten Tomato score of 48%, which I actually expected it to be lower, considering all the information I couldn't find for this film. The last time I had this much trouble finding the, finding the budget for a movie was Swashbuckler. Um, and it also has an IMDb score of 4.8 out of 10. So yeah, 48% kind of across the board. And honestly, if you look at the actors that are in it, it's kind of weird that it's so unknown. Like, I mean, it's got Mark Hamill, Bill Paxton. Yeah. F Murray Abraham's mentioned Ben Kingsley has a small role, if not a cameo in the movie. I'm really apprehensive as to why I had such a hard time finding anything on this film with these people in it. So, um, but we'll, we, maybe we'll get to that here in a minute. But your uh, RT score is actually wrong. It's a 43%. Oh, well, it went down 5% since I wrote the script 24 hours ago. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> but it, it, you didn't mention the audience score of 22%. Oh. Are you oh. sure you weren't looking up the uh, slipstream from 2007? I got to look it up now. I'm curious. No, that one got a 25%. Oh, dear <laughs> Lord. So, note to Hollywood, do not make movies titled slipstream. Apparently because not. <laughs> it's a curse. Oh, Michael Bay two. just heard this podcast and he's like, "Challenge accepted." Oh, no, God no, Michael Bay. No, yeah, no, no. No, I'm not going to get too much into what Tom's going to talk about. Hopefully, like I said, I just, I, I was just amazed. I couldn't find anything on this film other than the release date, and that was it. So um, no trivia, not even like background drama. No, no, no. I've got a little bit of trivia. Like this movie is in the public domain. It's in the public domain because producer Gary Kurtz was having major financial difficulties while the production took place. And uh, he was in the middle of a nasty divorce, which he lost. And he lost all the profits from the Star Wars movies, which were, he used to finance this movie. So or part of it, at least. And it's one of the major reasons why this movie has gone into the public domain. Like 
1989, I know it, it really wasn't that long ago. How many other movies from that long ago are in the public domain? Um, unless they accidentally don't put in like the copyright in the, um, yeah, he credits. couldn't afford to re up it. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you have to re up the rights or something like, cause that's why like old Disney productions like steamboat Mickey and all that aren't in public domains. Cause they, they well, keep re up in the rights. Well, they have no, no, they have to pay off their congressmen and lobbyists and whatnot in order to do that. Because technically, technically the original copyright laws was like patents, but then like Disney kept lobbying Congress and kept getting it changed. Well, then it's firmly established in canon for this universe that Gary Kurtz does not have that kind of money because this movie's in the public domain. I don't know. Like, I I just thought that this movie would be a bigger deal. It's actually Mark Hamill's first live action performance since Return of the Jedi. Really? Yeah. Like, he didn't make any other movies after Return of the Jedi and then came back for this one. Also, Mark Hamill, it's the first time he ever got to play a villain. I thought that that would be... Like, oh, okay, that would put butts in seats. Um, no, it, it's just kind of weird. Um, filmed in, well, I'm getting into Tom's uh, realm. No, no, bit. no. I think in, in terms of where it was filmed and such, that that definitely falls into your category. Okay, well, it was it was filmed in Ireland, and you can kind of see it in the movie with the rolling hills and the, the cliffs. And the, they, they did a lot of, to establish the universe of this film. But, yeah, it's... I don't know. It's really hard to find any like legitimate lasting trivia for this because unlike flash Gordon, which we watched last week, which was bad. We all agree that that was a bad film flash Gordon. While it was a flop in the theaters, it was, it became a cult classic movie. I never heard of this film until we did our list a few weeks ago. So this movie's not a cult classic. It's not a regular classic either. It's a forgotten movie it's a footnote in the careers of some of the people that were in it i i honestly i apologize to the audience in advance but there's like almost nothing on this film that i could find maybe a little more information in the box office would help yeah. us out see maybe it's you know what it had to compete with that yeah could, uh, well i couldn't find more. anything on the box office but that's not really my job josh were you able to mine any gold out of this um no i mine <laughs> and i found almost nothing it was never like you said we never released in north america it had a very short cinema run in the uk but i can't find any numbers on that the only numbers i can actually find uh was at the very bottom of its wikipedia entry where it says the film grossed sixty six thousand eight hundred and thirty six dollars during its entire run in australia oh my god Holy so it cow. it made 66 grand that's it jesus um, christ that didn't even pay for the salaries of one of the actors i promise you yeah, probably not but it's yeah apparently it had like moderate vhs cells and like they said that even gary kurtz said that there could be an, a director's cut released but the script was originally much more violent i'm literally reading the wikipedia entry it was like it could have been much more violent but it made the plot incoherent and those scenes were never filmed but to the box office, it, it's not even showing on IMDb or mm-hmm. Box Office Mojo. Box Office Mojo has nothing about Slipstream. The only Slipstream you can find is that shit one from 2007. But yeah. I'll yeah. go ahead and say what was on the weekend it was released, because it was released the weekend of February 10th, 1989. The top movie that weekend was The Fly 2, which grossed $6.7 million. So almost 100 times more money than that movie did in its <laughs> entire run. A few more zeros and a couple more decimals. <laughs> yeah. Um, number two was Three Fugitives. Um, number three was Rain Man. Number four was Bette Midler's Beaches. And number five was Her Alibi. I know two of those films. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Sorry, Josh, I stepped on your toes. Continue. No, you're fine. You're fine. Other notables on, on that weekend was Twins, Working Girl, and The Naked Gun from the Files of Police Squad. Now, those films I do recognize. But for 1989, I mean, um, I really got to stretch out my box office segment here because uh, Dan told me that if, you know, the reason mine is so short is because I don't invest properly into this. Whoa, so whoa, next- whoa, 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 stop the bus. We need yeah. to get out from under it. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to have those tire treads on my body for the next couple of days. I mean, well, no, Jesus. you said that the reason you actually put in all this extra work and like, cause I have the shortest of the three segments. Oh. Oh, right. Okay. That's what I said. Right. Yeah. 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 Because I don't, word. I don't invest. Yeah. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Catchphrase. <laughs> I Take I a kid. drink. Um, but no, for 1989, uh, it was a big year for movies. I know you guys can tell me what the number one grossing movie was that year. Batman. Batman. But um, 
other notables for like number one was Batman. Number two was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And these are grossing for the year 1989. Number three, Lethal Weapon 2. Four, Rain Man. Number five, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. At number seven was Ghostbusters 2. And at number 10 was Back to the Future Part 2. Uh, you know, there's a lot of movies that came out that year. But Slipstream was one of those that was just not reported. I mean, I got one last thing that I, I forgot to mention before we get into Tom's meta. Unless, Tom, Josh, are you... Is that yeah, all you I'm got? Done. I was, I was, I was okay. about to segue to Tom, so okay. uh, go ahead. I'll give well, you the segue. I will say that this movie was marketed all wrong. Movie trailers and posters, what little there was for marketing, portrayed the film as an edge-of-your-seat sci-fi action flick. It's very much not. It's a road movie. A road movie is when two or more characters are trying to get from point A to point B and along the way make stops at points C, D, and E and have adventures or hilarity or whatever. It's usually done in comedies. A great example would be Dogma, Dumb and Dumber, but can sometimes be used for drama too. An example is one that we've seen on this podcast, Midnight Special, is a road movie. But that's kind of what this movie is, but apparently it was not marketed that way at all. But it doesn't matter because it wasn't even released in the United States. Okay, we have no numbers for the box office. We've got fuck all for trivia. Tom, what can we expect out of this film? Well, I'm glad you asked, Nigel, because I think we're wandering into Pathfinder territory here. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. Slipstream, tagline, from the depths of the earth to the edge of existence, the hunt is on. Oof. Description, in the near future where Earth has been devastated by man's pollution and giant winds rule the planet, bounty hunter Matt, played by Bill Paxton, kidnaps a murderer, Byron, played by Robert Bob Peck, out of the hands of two police officers, planning to get the bounty himself. Traveling across the windswept landscape, Matt and Byron are relentlessly pursued by the officers, one of them being... um. Mark Hamill's character, I believe. And Matt finds Byron isn't what he appears to be as they travel from community to community and encounter pockets of strange societies that live beyond the slipstream. It's an interesting, I mean, description, but like I said, as we're going to get into this, this looks grim. Much like Pathfinder, which is why I'm saying this is Pathfinder territory, the talent behind it, the the people in front of the camera, they seem pretty quality, but the people behind it just don't make sense. It doesn't really lend itself to any sort of like confidence. To start with, going with your producers, Nigel, yeah, there were like five producers, but the only one of note was Gary Kurtz. Uh, he produced a lot of Jim Henson and George Lucas stuff. New Hope, Empire Strikes Back. American Graffiti. This was his first foray away from Lucas and Henson. And as Nigel noted, uh, it was also his last, unfortunately. In terms of writing, the story was created by Bill Barr, who has no credits to his name, and written by Tony Caden, who did mostly TV shows and direct to VHS stuff, Little House on the Prairie, uh, an Anthony Michael Hall movie called Out of Bounds. But this was peak Anthony Michael Hall, 80. So maybe that's a de- deal. Uh, the director, Steven Lindsberg, has only done two films before this. John Cusack's film Hot Pursuit and Tron. Oh. Yeah, both of them thematically, as Nigel noted, escape journey films, but way differently stylistically. And since then, yeah, he's done nothing else. And... I'll get into more about some of the other people behind the camera, but in front of the camera... It's decent ensemble cast, but most of them are just like periphery, like top level, B level, but not quite A level. They work great in ensembles, but not ready for being leads. Bill Paxton playing Matt. He's been on the podcast before with Predator 2. He's uh, less a character actor, more of an actor who's a character. But like I said, he's almost exclusively side character and peripheral ensemble. Never really like a proper lead. Robert Peck. Bob, you probably recognize him more as um, Clever Girl Hunter Muldoon from Jurassic Park. I think the only reason he's a lead in this is because uh, it was filming in um, Ireland and a lot of like Australian stuff. And that's pretty much all he does if he's actually in a movie. He doesn't do much else. And finally, you have Mark Hamill, as Nigel noted, coming off of a stint of not acting since Star Wars. And this is his first chance to be a villain his voice acting career has been great 
Batman animated series, regular show, so on and so forth. But man, his movie career has been lousy. Guyver, enough said. Hey, hey, hey. I like that. <laughs> Josh's opinions don't count in this one because Guyver is lousy. That is agreed upon by the internet. Oh, yeah. I'm not denying that, but I like that movie. Yeah, but those three main characters, with the exception of Hamill, um, not really lead characters. And the rest, of all every other character I saw here, F. Murray Abraham and them, it's weird because you got Robbie Coltrane, who's our connector. You might know him better as Hagrid from Harry Potter. He looks like a cameo or an extra because I haven't seen any lines from him in IMDb. F. Murray Abraham, he plays Cornelius. We would recognize him as the villain Cyrus from 13 Ghosts. He has 125 credits to his name. He's also, he's also Rolfo in uh, Star Trek Insurrection. That's right, he is. Thank you for that one. We have a Star Trek reference. Take a drink. Take a drink. Take a drink. An obscure Star Trek reference, one I don't even get, so take two drinks. <laughs> and Ben Kingsley is in this, playing a character called Avatar. Uh, again, great Shakespearean character actor. Uh, for those watching, um, he was the Mandarin in Iron Man 3. Yeah, that's the movie people remember him from. Okay, if you're you're most recently you remember him yeah. from that. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm giving you shit, but yeah, that's yes. Well, that, is that sad that that's the first thing I thought of when you said his name? Actually, I think of him in Ender's Game because he was in Ender's Game too. Oh but... God, he was so good in Ender's Game. Well, he's a great actor. He's a fantastic actor. He's not choosy with his role, so his IMDb page goes from Gandhi to the love guru and everything between Morgan Freeman is like that too. Morgan Freeman is a fantastic actor. I would watch two hours of Morgan Freeman reading the phone book, mm -hmm. but Morgan Freeman's also been in like some duds. Oh, well, some people just like to act though, I guess. Yeah. But aside from that, uh, there's nothing else. There's been no awards, no drama. So it just going by the cast and the crew, I, I don't know. We're going to get some good acting. At least. We'll get some enjoyable yeah. acting, but I think this is going to be a hard thud. So, Nigel, now that we know who worked on this film, how much uh, it grossed, and some of the tidbits, what are you expecting from this film? Well, um, I didn't even think about it until you mentioned it, but looking at the parallels between the two, I'm kind of expecting another, not another swashbuckler, but another Pathfinder. This one might be a hard one to get through just because, but then again, I don't know. I know that it's got a lousy rating on Rotten Tomatoes and I know that it's got a middling rating on IMDb, but I don't know anything about this film. I couldn't find anything on it. I love the man. Don't get me wrong. Mark Hamill's great, but uh, outside of Star Wars and being the voice of the Joker and he's got a following for the Wing Commander video games in the 90s. Uh, he's not really a leading man and his movie career outside of star Wars is pretty atrocious unless he's playing basically a parody of himself in a different movie. Um, Bill Paxton is a fantastic actor, but I've never really pegged him as a leading man. Mm -hmm. He's always been kind of one that plays either second or third or even fourth banana to another actor, you know? So I don't know. I just, th I don't think this movie's going to be any good. It's kind of a shame because I couldn't find too much trivia on it, but I did find that they did a lot of like world building with it. Like they really did a lot to try to establish the world that these guys live in with this whatever natural eco disaster that caused this what they call the slipstream, which is basically like a uh, the uh, our jet stream ramped up to eleven or people living in cliffs. They get around this world with hang gliders and hot air balloons and glider planes and stuff like that. Like that kind of sounds interesting. And it definitely sounds like it's a different take on a post-apocalyptic trope than the usual Mad Max style way of going about it. But I don't know. I just, I don't think we're going to find a hidden gem. I think we're going to find a forgotten gem and we're going to, we're going to be about halfway through this film and we're going to realize real quick why this movie was forgotten. <laughs> but that's, you. those are my expectations. Uh, Josh, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to enjoy this movie, but like we said, and since the, uh, selection section, what's in the box, I saw the trailer. I'm like, I've got to see this movie. And I really wanted to see it, you know, on the episode. So I'm probably going to regret this. And I, I thought this from the beginning is I'm probably going to regret pushing this movie really hard, but I mean, come <laughs> on, Bill Paxton and Mark Hamill in a movie in the eighties. But yeah, I'm just like... Uh, I don't know. It just does not seem very good. Um, the fact that we can't find any information, like you say a forgotten gem. 
I don't think this is a gem. I think this is one of those instances where we're going digging for fossils. We think we found one and it turned up to be shit. Yeah. Like it's, not even fossilized shit. Yeah. It's not fossilized shit. It's shit from a dog that went yeah. two weeks ago. It oh, just yeah. in the hard sun. It dried out. Yeah. Or like, even, hey, look at this. Even worse. We thought we made a new discovery and we just dug up the neighbor's cat. Mm. It's like, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like in Joe Dirt when he thinks he has a meteorite. I so was thinking the, the air, same uh, thing. It's like that's that's space. That's an airplane dookie. Yeah, that's that's spa- that's an air shit, airplane shit. And he was eating like French fries off of it and everything. And I think that's what tonight's going to be. I think tonight is going to be the Joe Dirt meteorite. Yeah. I, I honestly, you know, last week I said if I can get to the point where I recommend this movie to people, I think I will be happy. And I was like, I, I couldn't do that with Flash Gordon. I like, I will never recommend that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, if I come out of tonight and I can recommend this movie to people because I hate them, I'll be happy. <laughs> Suffer like we suffered. I yes. very shot him. Yeah, I would love to know. Well, uh, I would love to know before we get to Tom's expectations. I would love to know more about the production of this film. Why mm-hmm. did it get dropped so hard? It didn't even get a North American release. Not even a limited release in North America. That's like. I yeah, know B I, movies made by Roger Corman that got releases in North America. And this one didn't, this one had the producer from star Wars on it. This one had the actor from star Wars on it. Like you don't even try to release it in North America. I would, I just really wish I could find more information on the production of this film, but apparently like a, Mark Hamill doesn't even talk about it at conventions or anything like that. So, well, I don't uh, think anyone remember knows to ask him about it. I think we're the only three outside of the people who made this film who would know to ask him that yeah. question. Wait, I was in that. <laughs> yeah, so we were very drunk and high at that time. Yeah. I had I had Empire money. I was I was high. So, what are you thinking to get it? What are you thinking to get out of this? Yeah. Oh, oh from, Tom. Oh, thank you for asking. I, I stepped all I, over. I get you the know? segue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You actually, Josh, you do it. I, I am stepping all over the toes tonight. I am actually, I am out of order tonight. So Josh, please give this leg away and redeem me, please. I am all the over the back. The skin is bleeding into the yeah, actual podcast. I am so sorry. I am so, so sorry. You're fine, Dan. So, um, Tom, what are your expectations? By the way, I'm keeping that in. <laughs> you, nope. you, you need to. You have to. But my my concerns before I started digging into this was that this was going to be like Giver, where it was just going to be this hideous, low budget sort of just nasty. The reason the reason you've never heard of it, sort of thing. Like unless you go to a dime store in New Zealand or something. But what I'm expecting is this might be better than Pathfinder. I mean, it's still going to be probably garbage, but it's going to be pretty looking garbage. For the senior special effects, you have Steve Kulane, who did Judge Dredd and Captain America, the first Avenger. Then before this was the never ending story. And then you have the model designer, John Packnam, who did Empire Strikes Back and Crawl. So it's going to look good. And for the score was done by Elmer Bernstein, who did the Magnificent Seven Ghostbusters, just a stupid amount of good film. So it's going to look good. It's going to sound good. And acting wise, it's probably going to be pretty well acted. I'm just not so sure about the directing. That's what scares me. That's why I'm thinking this is going to be Pathfinder because you had all those talented people in front of the camera. Just no one knew what to do with them. I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm hoping this will turn into a passable watch because I'm not going to lie. I'm checking into the background. Some people... Um, had some varying different opinions about this film. It- Real quick, before we segue into that, I wanted to make a comment about your special effects thing. Guyver, you did compare it to it. And I, I do say I like that movie, but that's purely on a nostalgia high. Guyver had some amazing special effects, especially for a 1991 movie. Those uh, practical effects driven uh, costumes that was used mm-hmm. were awesome. Like and- even to today, they were awesome. But the movie was not. <laughs> okay, so maybe this is going to be like a Guyver. Ooh. Could be. Yeah. 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 Did you ever finish Guyver? I know you started watching it. Uh, and it's been a year. I'll get back to you on that. But uh, anywho, you were saying about other people who liked this, Tom? I was indeed, Josh. But you know what? 
me just telling you about them is a boring thing. So I'm going to ask you about them. So I've got five or so reviews that I'm going to quiz you on. Standard rules, one to ten stars. Person who gets closest gets a point. Person who gets on the money gets two points. If you're both within the same range, neither of you get points. Person with the most points at the end of five questions wins next week's trivia. So are you ready? Yep. Last time Dan and I went up, I beat him six to null. It's true. So, Dan, this is your chance to redeem yourself. This is this is either A, your chance to redeem yourself, or B, let me get into your head and beat you six to nothing again. Yeah, let's get it over with. <laughs> All right, well. That's what she said. Gross. Just for that, I'm going to let Dan go first. Oh, that's bullshit. Uh, no, no, you did a that's what, also that's what she said. <laughs> See, now you have to let me go first. No, no, I've already said it. Dan goes first. So, Nigel. This uh, review comes from KnifeBat, who says, If you're able to turn all those disappointments into unexpected pleasures of refreshment, then this film is for you. Are you up for the challenge? I'm going to say 4 out of 10. Say it one more time. If you're able to turn all of those disappointments into unexpected pleasures of refreshment, then this film is for you. Are you up for the challenge? You said four out of ten? Yeah. Five out of ten. Josh is closest. That's a ten star. Oh, no shit. shit. Damn. <laughs> I was honestly thinking it was like a six or a seven. <laughs> no, that's the ten star review. I <laughs> never would have guessed that. <laughs> okay, so Josh, you get the next one. This one comes from Marimba Daddy, whose title of their review says Mad Max plus Blade Runner equals Slipstream, parentheses, except it stinks. I am going to go five out of ten. Three out of ten. Josh, you are now tied up with Dan because Dan got that point. That is a two-star <laughs> review. Well, at least I won't get shut out. <laughs> at least, yes. Congratulations. All right. <laughs> but Dan, that leads you into the next question. This one's from Mad Mad Bastard Devil Steph. I think I said that right. Who said, Okay, if you're looking for a seriously good quality sci fi film, I wouldn't expect you to enjoy this movie. Five out of ten. Damn it, that's what I was going to say. Um, four out of ten. <laughs> Nicely done, Nigel. It's another 10 star review. Damn. <laughs> Jesus. Yes, they followed this up with, but. If you're looking for something thought-provoking, entertaining, and with lots of um, original acting... Wait, you cut it. a sentence in half? No, no, that's... No, I didn't cut the sentence in half. That was the next sentence after it. Yes. <laughs> All right, Dan, you're ahead of me now. If you beat me tonight, it's like you got owned the first two weeks, but it's like you you, you, you came back and won it <laughs> the next two times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so... Josh, you get this one. This one's from Daryl the Oscillator, who says, Just bought the movie for a buck. It is worth it, but not much more. Just bought the movie for a buck. It is worth it, but not much more. I'm going to go three. I'm going to say one. And Josh ties it up again. That's a four-star review. Nice. I almost said four. Damn it. You should have. You should have. Oh, well. so, so this is it. This is for the uh, the money. This is the fifth question. This is question number five. All unless right. we get it tied at the same. Unless we, yeah. Unless we pick the same distance apart. Mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna go with Zuropa Seven, who says in their title, the title of this one is flawed but underrated British sci-fi movie that deserves a look. I think it's Nigel's. Yes. Yeah. Seven out of ten. Josh. Eight out of ten. Well, Josh, now Dan is in your head because that was a <laughs> six-star review. <laughs> and Dan, I thought it was I thought it was a high one. <laughs> Dan wins the trivia. Order has been restored. Fuck you, Josh. I'm changing the order now. <laughs> Wrong. I had it the other way. No, no, <laughs> I was no. supposed to win. <laughs> this is what you get for trying to price is right. It is. Well, I went. I, 
Honestly, I could have gone under and nailed it on the head. Come on. You could have. I, I felt it was a uh, a higher end review. But still, good job, Dan. Yes. So you, you have successfully, well, you didn't get, sh- you didn't shut anybody out, but uh, you've redeemed yourself. Well, partially redeemed yourself. Those were pretty bad losses. Yeah, but, but, I, I, but I bounced back and now I'm at 500, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'd give you 250. No, 500. I, I'm even. I lost two in a row and I won two in a row. I don't know yeah, how but you really goes. lost. It's just averages. It's math. That's why I know this one. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. If you lose one game 100 to nothing, but you win the next game 1 to nothing, you still won the next game. It is technically a win. It is technically a win. Oh, God, this song and dance again. No, no, no. It goes Tom, then Josh, then Dan, and that's who says, Tom, play the music. It was Tom's turn this time. (laughs) No, no, it's the order. I'm playing the music. Welcome back to another easy breezy episode of the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and gliding instructor, Tom. Now, you see all that ground down there? Try not to fly into it. Common rookie mistake. Trust me, you only get one of those. But thank you for flying with us into this week's episode of The Fire Pit. We're on the final punch of our sequel season, The Fire Pit Strikes Back, and ready to swing on into the king of sequels, The Empire Strikes Back. But while we soar towards our destination, let's say we do a quick flyby of the team to see how their vacation is going. I had first class booked and everything. Why fly first class, Tom, when you could be in a hot air balloon? I could be on a beach, sipping my ties. Oh, come on. Think about it. You could be floating over all this awesome Kansas farmland, admiring for miles and miles. So far, you could see the curvature of the earth with your two best friends. Dad would be grilling some steaks right now. Yeah, well, we'll hop on in and we'll get to grilling some hot air. Someone in a grass skirt would be playing steel drums. I hate steel drums, but I'd be too drunk to care. All right, well, um, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no, no, I, I, I get, what are you doing? I, I get to run the fire thingy. God, if you're up there, please just kill me now. What? No, no, you d- you drove here. It's my turn to drive. Tom gets shotgun. You get the back seat. What back seat? It's it's a basket. <laughs> I burn the fire thingy. Now move. No. Schedule says I do. It's my turn. I'll <laughs> I'm done. Okay, I'm done. It's, it's been a week. That's my week. That's my vacation. My vacation's over. I'm t- it's time to go back to work. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, Tom. Tom, you, you can drive. What? No, he can't. It's going to screw up the whole schedule. No, that's all right. That's all right. I'm out. I oh, look. It's time to get the podcast started, guys. Uh, welcome to the fire pit. Did... Did he just jump out of the basket? You mean the back seat? I, I mean... Whose turn is it to get to body? Oh, for fuck's sake. No, no, no! No. No. Sorry. No. Now see, that's what happens when you don't avoid the ground. But if you want to avoid rookie mistakes of your own, or and if you want to let people know how to stay in the air with your own products, or if you want to have some light conversation with us here at the podcast, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line as well as all the email that you're emailing us whether it's for an ad a comment about past episodes a recommendation for future episodes or whatever's helping to keep you on your flight path and shoot us a line from there we'll read it hold it into a nice aerodynamic shape take it to the highest point we can find launch it towards the horizon, preferably on a good breeze, and never respond. 
paper airplanes were meant to fly, not be responded to. Duh. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I at gmail.com. Oh my! Uh, see that mountain coming towards us? Yeah, it turns out we forgot not to fly towards it! Ooh! boy. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna fly this thing to the scene of the crash. I'll let you bail out into the next episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck! And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Josh, why is this version 142 minutes long? When I said the runtime was 101, is there honestly know. a director's cut of this film that added 20 more goddamn minutes to this film? Who asked for that? No one. I guarantee not even the director's family asked for that. Well, no, I think this has an extra 20 minutes tacked onto the end credits of the director just crying. Post-apocalyptic Australia, which looks the same as regular Australia. We are the man in black. Galaxy Defenders. Better movie. Is this a Ghostbuster soundtrack? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yes. Like, seriously, it just sound exactly like the Ghostbuster soundtrack. Oh my god, this is from Ghostbusters. Seriously, this is freaking Ghostbuster soundtrack. Was it the same composer? Yes. By composer, we mean he just took what he had already made and just put it in. Well, this is totally ripping off a better film. Oh, yeah. North by Northwest. Yeah. Like a plague. That's my girl always joking. Bill Paxton, as always, turning in a solid performance. So I lie down after a long ride. I feel like pounding rock a couple of years. Are you offering? Mm. Wait. Oh, you mean actually pounding rock. Never mind. Muldoon back there just staring. The director gave him no direction, so he's like, I'm just going to stare. Oh, my oh. God. Well, he just Jesus no Christ. showed an airplane. What the? The force is strong with him. Stop ripping off music from better movies. There's those special effects Tom was talking about. Woo. Really stretching the budget on that one. Oh, Wow. Whoa. It's like I'm there. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. Stop. I don't know who's more impressive in this film. Bill Paxton or Bill Paxton's hair. So did that rock just fall on him? Mm. Dude, we left you alone for five minutes. Oh my god, I'd rather be eaten by a velociraptor than listen to this music anymore. Oh my god, where's the raptors? Hey, look at the size of that cock. <laughs> For those listening, it's a it's a it's a rooster. <laughs> Go and ruin the joke, Tom. What's the matter? Are you gonna miss me? Yeah. I've known you for ten minutes. You help us get him down. I'll give you the antidote. Then I'll shoot you. Spoiler alert, the antidote is a bullet. Oh. <laughs> it's funny because we're stranded. So these are the ones that worship the, the, the wind. Where's the wind deniers? Because <laughs> if 2020 taught me anything is that the world could have a, had like a catastrophic, you know, tilt on its axis that caused whatever is happening here and people would still deny it. Oh God, I have no control of the plane. I can't pull up. I can't pull up. Oh God. <laughs> is that all Hagrid's in this for? Because that would be hilarious. I think that's all Hagrid. Yeah. Also, that was Elmer Bernstein ripping off whatever he didn't use in the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> no, I see what they're doing. It's an Adam and Eve situation. Androids like to role play. Title of my book. Droids. The man slept with a robot. <laughs> Lynch. Oh, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, hold whoa. on, hold on. Let's take a step back, okay? And uh, you guys went to eleven pretty quick there. Yeah, we're still on three. <laughs> Fuck, yeah. Damn. Damn. Equal rights, equal fights. Mm, no shit. <laughs> Fuck around and find out. 
God, I desperately want to quote what Bill Paxton said in the first Terminator right now. This is a knife. Wait. We can't imprison them. We tried that once before. But it worked last <laughs> Until he went crazy and killed half of us. But it worked. I'm your friend. Anytime somebody says that, I definitely invest in that multi-level marketing scheme. You want to be your own boss? Yes. Come work for me. But I thought I would be my own boss. You will. Yeah, make your own hours. Be your own boss. Work from home. I want all those things. And if you buy this starter pack for $10,000. Can I get two and be make twice as much money? Of course. You could even buy three. Hold on, let me check your bank account. Here's my account information. We can set you up with four starter packs. I've got a retirement plan. R2, can you see what <laughs> can do anything about that? I've lost R2. <laughs> Use the force. Trust your feelings. <laughs> Oh my god, that was awesome. <laughs> dun 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 dun. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> We're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Boom! <laughs> so, did they make it? <laughs> Is it dead? They made it. Dun 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 Da 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 da. <laughs> Bill Paxton will be back in a much better film. And now, back to the episode. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't hate this movie. No, it wasn't a good movie, but I we've seen worse on this podcast. Oh, much worse. I mean, it's this was an absolute shit film, but it had some redeeming qualities. It's I, oh boy. All right, so Dan, you're first. Okay, so this movie exceeded my expectations, but not by much. It wasn't a good film. Definitely was not a good film, but um, I didn't hate it. And it was, I don't know, the, most of the story kept me engaged pretty pretty well into the movie. The only part, I, I kind of bogged down when they found the, I don't know what they, where they were, the lost lost city of rich folk or or the you know the the museum people or oh or uh, what uh, vault one seven seven you know, or something. yeah yeah when they found one of the other vaults and it was just full of a bunch of like rich upper crust people or something like i don't know it's just it bogged down big time on that one and didn't pick up again until mark camel came back and just shot up the place and like oh finally something's happening I will say this. I was engaged almost the entire film. I, I ended up watching this and I never once looked at my phone, which I actually thought this was going to be a movie. I was going to look at my phone almost the whole night. I didn't tab over and look at anything unless I was looking up what movie Elmer Bernstein was sampling from <laughs> in his music choices. So I guess it's got to say something. But the one thing that gets me about this film is it really doesn't feel like a theatrical film. It really does feel like either a made for TV movie or a pilot for a television show like slipstream the series uh it, it maybe it's the production values maybe it's the way the camera was done um but either way it just felt like a television pilot and there were a lot of things that were happening like i could see like the initial setting up the characters and and mark hamill's character chasing them because he's this like renegade lawman like that's season one and the vault people is season two yeah, I don't know. It just kind of felt a little like it should have been a television pilot. So, I think but, the Vault people would have been season three when they started running out of ideas and they had to bury them maybe, somewhere. Maybe <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. The Wind Worshippers would have been season two, like when they show up at the Wind Worshippers and all that. It's like, like I said, a lot of this movie felt very disjointed, and it did kind of feel like they were trying to mash all these different storylines together. Star Trek, the motion picture. That's the vibe I was getting from this film. Star Trek, the motion picture. Yeah. But, you, well, I see yeah, the parallels there. Yeah, yeah, I do too. That's a good analogy. Yeah, there. Cause Star Trek, the motion picture started off as Star Trek phase two, supposed to be a pilot for a new Star Trek series. Star Wars comes out, lights the world on fire. Paramount says, Nope, we're making it into a movie now instead of a television series. So they took a couple of the episodes, like the first three or four episodes of phase two, mashed them together into making Star Trek, the motion picture. And that's why that movie feels really disjointed. That's what this movie feels like to me. Five or six different storylines coming on at once. And we don't really know how to close them all out. So and a lot of padding between. Yes. Those 
but I don't want to keep rambling. I'm going to send things over to Josh and we'll just discuss as we go on. What about your final thoughts, Josh? I didn't hate this movie. Like I agree with Dan. It was engaging the entire time. It's like going on to recommendations. Would I recommend this film? And I'm not doing this to jab at you, Tom, but I did say in earlier in my uh, expectations that, you know, it's like if I could recommend this to my enemy, I would be happy with that. But I don't think I would actually recommend this movie. I would say like I, I watched it. I didn't hate it. I don't know if it's a recommendation. Like I would recommend somebody watch hard ticket to Hawaii because it's so bad. Mm -hmm. And I can understand somebody would have similar sentiment towards flash Gordon, but I don't think I could see myself recommending this movie at all. I could tell them it's like, let me tell you what I think about it. And that's all you ever need to know. Mm -hmm. But, um, one thing that kept hitting me up during the entire time I was watching this was going back to the recent, I don't even know if it was called recent, but it's one of those things where we've been talking. I know we have talked about it earlier on in this podcast is we shouldn't be remaking good movies. We should be remaking bad movies. And I feel like this movie is a prime candidate for that. Like, I think one of the big things in this is the universe was really engaging. It felt really fleshed out. But I felt like the story, like Dan said, was a little bogged down. So, yeah, I would say that this movie is a prime candidate for being remade like a bad movie to be remade i think that it has a lot of potential to be a good movie too oh yeah imagine like, this movie with a 200 million dollar budget and the hollywood hype machine hype machine behind it oh yeah i mean you could easily make this movie a lot more exciting i felt like mark hamill's character was interesting just give him a couple of like a couple extra character traits a little bit of a background i mean you could really start to sympathize with the characters in this one I'd liked the twist of him being a robot. It was one of those things where like, oh, I didn't see that coming. I honestly, I didn't hate the ending. God, this, the movie wasn't great. It wasn't terrible, but it was just slightly above mediocre. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say cardboard, but at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of feels like a movie that was punching above its weight class. Yeah. <laughs> like it definitely was. Yeah, it wasn't terrible, and that surprises me to say, because everything about this movie just reeks like, this is such a bad B-movie that's going to be so terrible. It would be on par with, you know, Sharknado or something. But no, going back to, like, Pacific Rim, the movie itself is got its ups and its downs, but um, one thing I always loved about Pacific Rim, and I think really drew me to it, was the universe. And I feel like same thing about this one. I found myself interested in knowing more about this universe. I feel like there's so much depth to this story that they couldn't explore. I feel like we're missing out a lot on that in this small story. I think, yeah, Dan, I think you're right. I think this would be an awesome TV show, especially in the... Uh, you know, exclusive TV show era that we're in right now. Like imagine like if this show was on like Showtime or Netflix or Hulu or something like, a, yeah, something with a lot of budget behind it. And or at least something like, yeah, more of a budget. I don't think this needs to be a big budget film either. It's just the concepts of it don't re reek. Like I think that the way it was done here was low budget, but I feel like you could do so much. You don't need a huge budget, but it would be cool. Like you guys were talking about to see, to have them travel through like San Francisco and then you see the ruins of the U.S. as they travel through big cities and stuff. Like if you were to readapt it that way, yeah, I could see you'd need a bigger budget. But mm -hmm. like even in the context of this film as it was, it was good. I liked it barely. But <laughs> I don't know, like beyond the music, um, I think we'll get more into that in a little bit. But I would have to say those would be my final thoughts. Um, Tom, what about you? A lot of what you guys have said, I'm probably going to echo here. It's a very cardboard film. Boy, it started off rough, but it did kind of grow on me once they got to the windstorm stuff. But Jesus, God, I'll say this much. The uh, composer gave us a lot to listen to. It, I mean, it shows that this guy composed the score for Ghostbusters, Magnificent Seven, The Black Cauldron, because he reused all of those scores through this whole He movie. didn't reuse the scores. He used the ones yeah, that Yeah, he didn't unreleased. reuse the scores. He used the unused tracks that he composed for those movies. That's because about that was, the same thing. Yeah, because, well, no, 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 because he can't use the ones that was in the movies due to copyright. But, but he, he could use the stuff that was not released. But he just had it lying around. Says, eh, I guess I'll just throw this in here. Him and like the early parts of the special effects, we noted, it just felt like they were doing it as a favor. But there was something there. I, I noted this as I was watching. There's a lot of parallels between this movie and Robin Hood. That the early scripts and such, everything going on with Robin Hood, 
could have made it this film if it hadn't been saved by its cast, bringing in their own people to help kind of fix it and all of them just adding their own flair. This needed that. We saw what the movie wanted to be. There was a lot going for it, especially in the universe. It just needed something more. Just yeah. The it budget, needs, yeah. the skill. Go ahead, Nigel. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not going to trample on your thoughts. I'm just agreeing with you. Mm-hmm. And again, this is I'm just retreading what you guys have said. I, yeah, I think we're moved on to the uh, group ta- group speak uh, part of the final thoughts. Yeah. You know, you were talking about this movie being like potential for a remake. I think this could have worked as a novel too. just everything in it, it's like big ideas. You could add so many more physics mm-hmm. to it. Would you agree with that as well? Yeah, I do. And I, I think I appreciate the world building they tried to do in this film and and they tried to definitely make it like Mad Max, but with gliders and planes instead of cars and trucks. Mm-hmm. But I wish they would have done a little bit more on the world building. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it's not, like not saying they got to reveal what happened, like to what happened. Because Mad Max doesn't really reveal what happens in the apocalypse. It's just kind of hinted that it's either oil or wars or a combination of the two, but they never really come out and say what caused the apocalypse. And that doesn't detract from any of the story in any of the movies. It just, things sucked. Things got worse. Now we're here. But the Mad Max films had a tighter budget and the director knew how to work with the world it was in Mm because the the span of the world they were in was too, well, it was too big, really. It's just like they had too many broad horizons. Like I feel like if they had a bigger budget, they could have shown the slipstream, you know, it's like there wasn't any like graphic to show you what that was. It was just like, we're up in the air and we're flying, but they didn't really portray it as its own like entity. I think like if you had a bigger budget, you could portray that as kind of like a character in the film. Like what is the slipstream? You could see it in the air type thing, you know, like the way stuff is on it, Mm -hmm. but it was just, it just felt looked like they were flying in this one. Yeah. The closest they they came was the, um, the wind, um, um, cult when they were in the mountains and they had that big yeah. like sandy windstorm. Then that point's like, oh, okay, this is interesting. But yeah, beyond that, it's it's nothing. It's nothing visible on screen. I think I would have liked to see a a representation of that. Yeah, agreed. Do we want to touch base on the acting and how just kind of disappointing this that your lead actors were consistently outacted by everyone else around them? Yeah, the, 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 the main character of this film was shown in every scene that they were in. And I'm talking, obviously, about Bill Paxton's hair. <laughs> yes. His yes. glorious mane was amazing and stole the scene in every single scene he was in. That great windswept 1980s, just brilliant. He had the curls, the nice dirty blonde curls that just flowed with the wind. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was. I agree with the other thing you were talking about. Yeah. Mark Hamill clearly was used to playing Luke Skywalker and did not know how to play anything else. But I don't think Mark Hamill had a bad, I don't think he turned into a bad I don't think, I don't think he didn't do too bad. And I give him a lot of credit in this film for trying to get away from being Luke Skywalker. Like he dyed his hair. He grew a beard. He definitely looked buffer in this film than he ever did as Luke. So yeah, I didn't get any Luke Skywalker vibes from him in this film. Neither like, I would, did I, but uh, it didn't. Bill Paxton didn't was very, well, I don't think he landed. I don't disagree that it wasn't, it was the best performance he'd ever turned in. I don't agree that it was a, like a bad performance. I, I think it was more bad dialogue than anything. Yeah. I don't really think his performance was that bad. I think he was definitely much, much different from Luke Skywalker in this film. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Well, I'm not saying he was playing Luke Skywalker. It's just, it, just, it didn't work. He just character was terrible. You, you, you both See, make a good point. There, right? I, don't know. I liked his character. I liked his character. And the most, the points of the movie where I was the most engaged in were the points where Mark Hamill's character was in frame. Like I, yeah. when he was there, like when he supposedly died or disappeared for a little while and didn't show up for like 15, 20 minutes. I, I, that's when the movie kind of bogged down for me. I was way more interested with Mark Hamill was, mm-hmm. was there. Yeah, I found his character was interesting. I thought that his acting was good for what it was. I mean, granted, I don't think it was like Oscar worthy acting. I think we get better acting through m- most of the MCU, but uh, I liked his character and I liked the way he portrayed him. I don't, I, so I don't agree with you. The at least on that regard, on that was a 
poor wooden performance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, real quick also, because I did not get her in my meta, Kitty Aldridge. Um, Got to give a shout out to her who played alongside Mark Hamill as kind of his partner, accomplice, uh, Belitsky. Just uh, want to shout her out because she did a pretty decent performance too. Mm-hmm. Um, not much after this film. It's kind of a shame. She, she could have been something. She could have been a contender. But not bad, not bad at all in here. If they maybe if they've all had better dialogue, maybe they would have been able to Yeah, the script definitely needed some work. It needed some tightening up. The dialogue kind of felt a little forced, wooden, uh, whatever you want to use for it. Just wasn't that great. Mm-hmm. Not in not in every spot. Now there were some points where the dialogue was pretty good, but for the most part it was kind of bleh, meh. Yeah. Not as bad as in Flash Gordon last week. But, oh, God, oh no. no, definitely not. Not Honestly, the more we got into this film, the closer we got to the end of this film, the more I wanted to know what the hell happened with this movie. The mm. convergence, like, they called it. No, 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 oh, no. I don't no, mean in, in the, the universe. You're talking the I real film. Know. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking like to quote Tom or to, to you know, the meta. Like what happened with this film? Like did you got did the budget get yanked out from under them like two days into production? Did they lose complete backing of their studio it just feels weird the divorce went through and all his money went it's away just, maybe that's maybe that did happen maybe his divorce went through and and they literally ran out of money it's just so weird this mm-hmm. film got no release in the u.s or, or it was uh the film was kind of a money cleaning thing it's like he didn't want to lose all his money in the divorce so he funneled it through this movie I so thought they this, had more to work with. This movie doesn't. <laughs> yeah. And, and this movie, this movie's not good. I'm not saying if it got a release in the U S it would have been a hit. It definitely would have been, especially in 1989 when we know all those good movies that came out in 1989, but this movie would have got buried with the, uh, the dead calms of 1989. It would have grossed more than $60,000. It would have grossed more than $60,000. And uh, I, this movie has cult classic written all over it. This movie, if it had been a little bit more of a release in the U S definitely would have cleaned house and video rental sales back in the eighties. Oh 90s. yeah. Oh yeah. People I, would I, have rented this film and it may have made some money on it. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying I appreciate this movie and I'd like it, but I can see where some people would like, I I've seen worse movies that are cult classics. Mm-hmm, so we had you worse know, movies on this journey that are considered cult classics like flash gordon's considered a cult classic and i couldn't wait for that movie to be over this movie is not a cult classic and i didn't hate it the whole way now i'm not in a hurry to watch it again but i definitely didn't hate this film yeah it's one we'll look, I'll, I'll definitely look back on it and i'll fondly talk about it but will i watch it again anytime soon unless somebody's really interested like ooh, what's that movie like oh uh, well it's not bad but if they really want to watch it i won't not want to watch it again yeah, yeah. See, I, i'm gonna diverge a bit i don't think this film was enthusiastic enough to fall into the so bad it's good cult classic yeah, i agree I do it's agree. competently done enough and it's watchable and re- and honestly in my opinion what saved this movie and kind of pushed it into like all right all right i'm behind this a little more was that ending that ending just just took it all the way it made it man it made it yeah, yeah. i can see that too the yes. ending was good. It was a good ending. That, that ending um, landed <laughs> hard, but it landed hard in a good way. Yes. But yes. you know, one thing I will say though, Dan, is um, you said this is a road movie where they're trying to get from point A to point B, but they hit C, D, and E. Mm-hmm. It never made it to B. No, the movie no, went. It, a, it was it was supposed to go A to B, but it went from A, C, D, E, and it stopped on E. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, where were they supposed to go, anyways? What was he was there? trying to get to? He was trying to get to some settlement down south or something like that. He wanted to open up his own balloon shop or balloon company or something to that degree. Basically, Bill Paxton's looking for whatever this universe's version of the American dream is. He wants to settle down, and have a family, have his own business. Mm-hmm. But um, he's he's always like a day late and a dollar short in achieving that dream. So he's looking for the enough money to be able to start this whole endeavor. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. was the end all be all end all destination. But I think it's implied in the film that he ended up staying with the museum people. So, or no, I, no, he got in a plane with the, the one chick and they went off. Whoa. To go find his balloon shop. Mm-hmm. But yeah. don't, okay. My bad. I, I'm sorry. I was, no, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Cause they, there was no real, you never got a scale for if they got close to the destination. It's like, 
uh, Josh. Because yeah, that, that was another thing. You didn't know where they were at. He said, we're lost. I'm like, I have no idea. Yeah. There's no landmarks. He's not using a map or anything else. He's like, we're here. We need to be here. And this, that, and the other. This movie could have gone on the five more hours and we would have had no scale or scope. Yeah, of where yeah that's yeah, why I, I say this this movie feels like a television pilot or like they had an idea for a TV series that somehow got greenlit into a movie and they ended up making a movie out of it because there's so many threads in this movie that would have been more fleshed out over the span of 22 episodes as opposed to two hours and one minute. Yeah. You know I mean, <laughs> yeah, the Android you know, killed. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Josh. I was going to say this movie definitely. <coughs> oh, crap. Something in my throat. Uh, it's like I would – no, I, I totally lost my train of thought. Go ahead, Tom. I'll, well, no, I was just going to say just well, while you're trying to unstick that thought. But this, I, 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 now my thoughts are getting stuck. No, the, you the, 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 the <laughs> yeah. android – Coffee's you have, wearing off. <laughs> you see – no, the android, the, he had the whole big deal like I killed a man. It's like my master, but never said – I don't think they ever said why, or why that was such a big deal. Did they ever even say that he killed his master? It's supposed to be as well. You're right. I don't. I think they never implied. specified who he killed. Yeah, there were a lot of things weren't specified. Mm-hmm. It kind of yeah. came out of the open again. Like, I'm just saying that they left so many threads undone. It just this would have worked better for 22 episodes as opposed to an hour and 40. Yeah, I Mark think I remember Hamill's- what I said. I say like the story was there. I think they had a good solid story, but I think the storytelling device was poor. Yeah, Mark Hamill's supposed to be a cop. But for what? From everything I see, it's just a random collection of just settlements and yeah. outposts with no central government. So who's he policing for? Yeah, it's like I said, it's like the storytelling device. I think the it was poor execution. It's like you got a good yeah. story, but it was poorly executed. Yeah, like they the even hint that his character is the way he is because of some tragedy. Like when he's in the plane with the, the girl, they're talking and she says something. I can't remember. The, it's really early in the film, but she says something like, he just wants like they're talking about Bill Paxton's character. She says like he just wants to settle down or something like that. She goes, "You ever tried that?" And he goes, oh, "Did once." Then it's never touched on again. So mm-hmm. it's like something may have happened. I mean, pick your post-apocalyptic cliche. Did his wife die? Did his kids die? Did his whole family die? I mean, just like you know, why is Mark Hamill's character the way he is? So mm-hmm. his dog died. Well, like I said, pick your post-apocalyptic cliche, but mm-hmm. but it works. It adds a little little flavor but then the rest of the stuff was just <laughs> smacked on yeah it's like i said the execution was poor so it poor Oof. The, the script needed like three or four and more rewrites and yeah then a uh, whole new it definitely script. needed some more and it like I don't, I don't think the script was bad like i don't think the story was bad the script probably yeah, the was script bad. is bad the story was okay the script was bad but mm. i don't know this movie could have used a couple more thousand dollars in the budget and could have <laughs> used a few more thousand hours in the writing room but uh mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's okay. all i got to say for it. i'm gonna keep looping around and going back to my it feels like a tv pilot that's my final final yeah. thought yeah yeah hopefully whoever's listening out here who has the money that this film needs and the people who can make it um have at it please because this deserves a better shot and to all those who are listening i know we don't do the whole like would we recommend or not but i mean it's watchable that much you can take away from this film yeah we can't promise you'll like it but we can't promise you and we can't promise you'll hate it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Give it's it certainly not the worst movie we saw on this journey which i thought it was going to be when we same here when we voted on this journey i thought this would be the worst one of the journey and it ended yeah, up we, not we, we keep saying what's in the box it wasn't a severed head it was like a rotten cantaloupe <laughs> it was christmas it was a, yeah <laughs> it yeah. was christmas and santa came into the box <laughs> came into this box. Gross. <laughs> and that's for, <sighs> that's it for tonight's show. As always, and as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes can be listened to on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. As we really appreciate it, and it really helps grow the podcast and uh, be sure to join us on our discord as well. The links in the episode's description and at firepit.podbean.com. We need to get a website. You'll get notifications of new episodes and uh, even better. You get to chit chat with other people who are on there. Um, we like to discuss episodes as they come up. We like to share funny gifts occasionally. It's a good time. Like we, we have a good time. We could always use more conversation, but uh, why don't you log in, take, 
take a look, see. Hopefully, you enjoy it. It's fun. And our email is mentioned back in the interspersal segment. If you want to send us a long message, a short message, a happy message, a sad message, I don't care. Uh, we're not going to read it. Um, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. We read them all. And also, please be sure to like our Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter. Trying to get better about using the Twitter. Good. None. I'm not hip with the crowd on that one. But both are linked in this episode's description as well. And I'd like to just shout out to a few of our Facebook followers. Uh, Stucklick and Schmid. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for being a part of us podcast here. And for everyone else out there, whether you're a Facebook follower or just listening in the quiet, appreciate you coming by and helping to keep the fire pits burning. And uh, I would like to shout out my mom because I know she's enjoyed uh, my shout out to my brother last week. And uh, shout out to, I guess, Sync Lounge and uh, Plex again. I don't have a lot of shout outs this week. So um, I... That's all I've got. Josh has no friends. I um, don't. We're all he's got. <laughs> Special shout out always to Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Always thanks for your listening every week and your feedback. Uh, also special shout out to Rob, Danielle, Tarek Thorne, our Discord followers. Uh, Nick, I mean, we just uh, you know appreciate you guys interacting with us and talking with us. And uh, that's always great. Just love it. And a special birthday shout out to my little girl. Thanks for putting up with that doing this every Saturday. So speaking of putting up, what are we going to be putting up with next weekend, team? Um, I don't know. It's another one of those movies that isn't very fondly remembered. It's supposedly the sequel to Star Wars, but they had no faith in it, so they gave it a different title. It's not called Star Wars 2. Why wouldn't you do that? That seems stupid. I don't know. Yeah. It's called The Empire. Like some, yeah, like, what are they going to, like... Yeah, I don't know. It just seems like... The Empire Strikes Back. Seems Which is like, such a try-hard title. It is. Like, yeah. it's like, uh, it's like oh, the bad guys are back. It's like, it's such a try-hard title. It's it's unbelievably cringe. Uh, it's going to be the worst Why did we pick one. this as a destination film? Uh, apparently, Star Wars has a niche but dedicated following. Yeah. <laughs> I did like the first one, so I guess we give the second one a shot. I suppose... But until then, I've been Tom. I've been Dan. Wait, no, I'm next. It no, goes Tom, it, Josh, it goes then Tom, Dan. then Josh, then or Tom, then Dan, then Josh. That's oh the order. Oh my god! No, it's yeah, it's Tom, me. It's I've been the middle this entire night, Dan. Tom, do it again. I go second. I don't want to anymore. You're on your own. I'm no next time. I've been Tom. I've been Dan. Ha! Ah, I went first. This is. I feel sorry for your wife. <laughs> I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. Hey, Tom. How was your trip? I uh, almost feel weird saying this, but you kind of used up all your vacation time, so you're not getting paid for this. Anyways, I'm bored. Uh, Want to go get some tacos? Yeah, we have been here for like, what, 10 minutes? Mm-hmm. All right, so who's driving? Uh, pretty sure it's my turn to drive. I don't 